Good afternoon, everyone. Praise the Lord. The scripture says we are to praise the Lord in all things. And I praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father, Jehovah. As I was driving over, I listened to the Christian Broadcasting radio station. And this is what I heard as I was driving over. No matter what it looks like on the outside, the word is, all is well. God is in control and all is well. So you all want to know what happened. And I have the explanation for you. I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ lets me bring forth this explanation. For the ears of mature Christian people in our ministry and whatever else the Lord might bring to hear it. This is the second time I'm giving this message today. I gave it to Jesse and the children earlier. After it came out, I said, I'm so sorry I didn't record it. But I guess I wasn't supposed to record it. This is the recording. I'm just waiting for the anointing to start. Brother. So we're all terribly disappointed that Sandra's body died and confused, possibly. I was confused. I'm not confused anymore about all the prophecies that she would live. So I think this is how it started this morning, because it's not me talking to you. It's Christ Jesus talking to you. Yeah. This is how it started. Well, well let, let me start with this. We, Jesse and the, representing the family and I, we did practice what I believe to be the truth as demonstrated by the, the Middle Eastern people that we heard about through, um, through the prophet Bill Norton, how when somebody, when their body dies, they take them to the church and they wait for the Lord to confirm, either confirm that they're dead or to raise them from the dead. So Jesse, in the practical situation, did believe that. He made arrangements to uh, uh, to, to view the body for the next three days, and I agreed in the spirit. But as of this morning, there were three witnesses that the Lord had taken her. Okay? As of yesterday, she was alive. To all of us, she was alive because she was still alive, even though her body had ceased functioning. Lord, please help me to bring this message forth. With it was so great this morning. Help me to do it again, please. So you, you're curious as to what the witnesses were. I woke up this morning, and I was, I think I was depressed. And I knew that something was not right in the spirit. I did not get any word, you know, what had taken her, but I knew something was wrong in the spirit. And then I got a text from uh, Jesse, and I'm really sorry that I left my cell phone home, so I can't read it to you word for word. The text was actually a, a forward from Sandra's sister, Salome, who I don't know her very well, but from what I've seen, she's definitely a woman of God and has discernment. And she was one of the people who was witnessing uh, that Sandra would live. The last time I spoke to her was at a family meeting, and she said, I don't see death. I just don't. And this was just a few days ago. I don't see death. And I said, Amen, I don't see death. And she had a dream, it was a vision. Um, and in that vision, Sandra, her hands and her feet were tingling. And then she was, um, uh, then she was a baby, a beautiful baby, and she was wrapped in swaddling clothes. And my understanding of the dream was that it meant that, uh, it meant that Sandra was gone, but that she would live again in another form, i.e. a form of transmigration. And we're going to go over that. I have some really good information for you all about that that has given it peace to my soul. Then there was another witness from Hannah, her daughter, who had a dream that, um, again, I apologize that I left my phone home. Uh, um, it, it, it was something like this. 
that there were pieces, pieces, she didn't know pieces of what, pieces were separating from Sandra. And what that means to me is part of the exhortation I intend to give you on death and reincarnation. The, what separates, what separates, Brendan, this has been such a learning experience for me. What, what is born, what is born as the soul of the, of the, of the individual, when a new baby is born, is actually a, a, a spiritual birth that takes place along with the physical birth. And it is the union of the, uh, the Shekinah and the seed, which we know is corrupted. That, that's been my whole message for weeks now, that she's been dragged down into the lower uh, window of creation, the Shekinah and her son, the mother and the son. Okay. That is born with every human being along with, okay, uh, the fallen soul. Um, I guess I guess it's the it's the it's the mother and the son, and the son is the fallen soul. The the soul is the seed of God that has fallen and is tarnished, that has the potential to rise from the dead and and live forever. Okay, we're all born with that. The, the Shekinah is the human spirit, and the, the soul is Abel, who's buried under Cain's ground. And in addition to that, there is a personality, which is basically Cain, which is born from the unholy, incestuous union between the mother and the son. So we're really born double-minded. We're not, we're not only double-minded when, um, when, we, when we, this is what I used to think, that when we're born, when we're born again, when, when our born again experience begins, and we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's when we become double-minded, as James tells us. But that's what I thought. But that's not true. We're born double-minded. we but but the issue is that the part of us that's that that is of God, the part of us that has the potential to to rise to rise again and live forever, is buried under under the sea water, under Cain's ground, and not functioning, mm. or functioning in a corrupt way. The, um, uh, the Shekinah is functioning as our human spirit because we wouldn't, we wouldn't have any conscious life without a human spirit. Mm. But she's tied together with, with Satan, functioning, uh, functioning as, as our motives as Satan. Yeah. So there's two of us from the beginning. When we have an experience with Jesus Christ, the, our human spirit starts to be cleansed, okay, and Abel starts to awaken and hopefully rises from under the ground. Depending on the degree of the ex instruction that we have, because we cannot, Abel cannot rise from under the ground without the truth. See? So, depending on what spiritual truth we have or how much spiritual truth we have, the mother and the son, which is the human spirit, and able come to life in us and that is what separates upon the death of the body the scripture says whatever we do for christ lives forever everything that we do that we do out of the part of ourselves that is the mother and the son okay lives forever how does that happen Abel. He, he is a cell, he is a cell in the body of cells of Adam, the creation of God, yeah. our higher soul. He's our potential for a higher soul. Okay. So, when we, when our personality experiences, has spiritual experiences through Abel, it changes him, it develops him. And when the, when the body dies, to whatever degree he's developed in us, he separates from Cain. Cain dies with the body. Cain is a part of the body, dies with the body. Okay. Abel was added to the body at birth with the potential to rise again. And every experience that we have, like we're having right now, because Abel and you, was in, or who we would call Christ, 
is interacting with Christ Jesus in me right now. This message will change you forever. And it will change Christ in you forever. Because every time I preach and you listen, every time we have a conversation and it's Christ in me and you listen, we're both changed forever. What Christ has to say to you changes you forever and your response changes me forever, changes Christ in me forever. Now, when I talk about me, it's you too, whenever you're ministering to somebody, okay? So when Christ in me speaks to you and your current mind responds to me, my response to your error is significant. And I'm telling you, I'm talking about myself, but this is you when you minister to other people. See? When I speak in Christ to you and you answer with your carnal mind, and I come back to you and say, that was your carnal mind, try again. As opposed to the possibility of you just insulted me and now we're on the outs with each other. Everything we hear and react to in Christ changes us in this world forever and changes the part of us that is Christ forever. The best example is our children. I told the Aldridge children this morning, they are Sandra in another form. We are our parents in another form. And we pick up the work, the spiritual work yeah, of cleansing Abel in us and making him more and more like like, Adam, like righteous Adam, like Christ Jesus. Okay. So that at some point, at some point in this world, which is a terrible place, okay, that, that, that soul part of Adam will mature to the point that the person that he's incarnated in will not die. Upon the death of the body, that's what separates. It's not Sandra. Sandra is not in heaven walking on streets of gold. But Sandra has produced a spiritual child, just like the Aldridge children are Sandra. If you, if you look at them at the right angle, they look like her. Every once in a while, she'll say something, they'll say something or do something, and they say, well, that's exactly what Sandra would have said. You all know what I'm talking about. There are no babies here. You all mature people here. You know what I'm talking about. Well, the Christ that was born with Sandra, okay, that had experiences, yeah, still lives. And has, but it's not Sandra. It's her child. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. That's what goes on. And that is what, and that is what, uh, in, in the dream, I guess it was, I'm sorry I didn't bring my phone with me. One of the dreams was Jesus came and carried her uh, away. It was probably Hannah's dream. That's what happened. When the body dies, it turns to dust. And the soul, because in us, it, I mean, oh, James says we're a double-minded person, but it's really one soul, okay? One soul, like twin souls, you know? That's what's ripped apart. The part that's joined to the body turns to dust with, with the body. The part that's joined to Christ Jesus okay, goes on and becomes a part of the body of cells of righteous Adam in the world of creation. Now, as I understand it today, some of the, some of, when this happens, when these soul, when the, these soul parts go on, go on, there's, a, there's a, a, a degree, there's a point at which when they pass that point, they come to a place where they can reincarnate, which, reincarnate in a manner that would be called Sandra in another form. But sometimes a person dies and they haven't changed, uh, Abel in them hasn't changed at all. Or Abel has changed in them a little bit, but has not risen to that criteria where the Lord would say they will go on in another form. Does, you know, does, anyone, know what, not know what I'm, does anyone not know what I'm talking about? Please interrupt me if you don't know what I'm talking about. So all of the prophecies and dreams that came down that Sandra would live, that's where it was coming from. 
it was it was my failure to understand the spiritual language of God as to what was being said. Okay. I was never told that her body would not die. Okay. I was told that Sandra would live. Right up to the last minute, I was told that Sandra would live. And I asked the Lord, please, Lord, I really need you to explain this to me because I'm not a false prophet. I know when you speak, I know it was you that said that to me. I need to understand. And so this message is my reiteration of what he told me. And I have a lot more to say. Please bear with me as I try to bring it forth uh, from Christ Jesus within me. So that's the, and, and, and it wasn't only me at the end, people were, other people were having dreams. Other friends of Sandra were calling up Jesse Tobin with dreams that she's going to live. So we need to learn the language of God. And the Lord was trying to tell us in the last message or two, and I didn't understand, and I don't think any of you understood. Two things happened in the recent messages. One of them was, I think just yesterday, that um, I gave the testimony of the two people that the Lord told me would die. One was my niece, who indeed, she died into my life. She's gone. She won't talk to me. She has nothing to do with me. I understand that she moved. She didn't send me a notice. She sent my nephew a notice where she moved. She has cut me out of her life. For all intents and purposes, she's dead. She died. She's gone. And the other person, you will know that I'm going to leave, unless Jesse asked me not to, I'm going to leave this message on the internet. So I won't name her name, but you will know her. The woman that uh, the, actually was the Lord who put her out of the ministry. The Lord told me that she would die. Actually, the truth of the matter is, at the time, I have it recorded in my files. For, for what, I, I do understand the reason. Because of the, of the spiritual height, is somebody here? Okay. Oh, Brooke, hi. Oh, th Brooke, thank you so much. Um, so, the, well, you won't know something about this effort. Okay. The prophecy, the prophecy of the prophets comes forth from, from Bina. From, from the third grade of power of the God world of emanation. And those prophecies are all uh, from, the, from the world of emanation, from the God world, and they're, they're national. They're national. They're, just read it. They're national. They're about Israel. They're about Egypt. You know. The prophecy that's coming forth from the church is from Netzach Hod. And in other words, it's coming forth from, from Christ Jesus in the world of creation. Okay. The, Israel, the, the Israelite prophets came from the world of emanation, from the God world. They were infallible. The scripture says, if they don't come to pass, you need to execute them. But the prophecy that's coming forth in the church today is coming forth from the developing, maturing Christ in the church. And, and he is limited in his authority. His word stands when the word from the world of emanation agrees with him. So he is doing his job. Actually, this is the word that I had for Jesse uh, when we still hope that her body will live. That, you see, the Lord gives me, the, gives me understanding in pieces, okay? For what, that's how it comes forth. Even if it's a day apart, that's how it comes forth. So that's what he told me, that Christ was doing his job. Christ and everyone that I know that knows her was saying, she lives, she lives. Okay. Christ in the world of creation was prophesying her life. The son was prophesying her life, but it needed to be ratified, his word needed to be ratified by the father from the world of emanation. He was doing the right thing. And again, I'll, I'll develop this as the Lord lets me, okay? as the Lord qu quickens me to do it. But apparently the, world, the, the word from the world of emanation 
did not ratify, the, the word of the father did not ratify the word of the son. That is what happened. But it did ratify, the word of the father did ratify the word of the son in that Sandra's soul will live. I, no, I never heard one word saying her body would live. So the more we can understand the language of God, the better off we will be. And the way I put it to the children is this. It's really important that we understand this because whether it's happening to you now or not, it will happen eventually. The thoughts will seep into your mind. Why didn't God save her? And these were my thoughts as I prayed all along. This incredible anointing that came out of her at the last conference, why wouldn't you save her? I don't understand it. So I had multiple questions. And we need to understand God's language. He never said he would save her body. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Christ Jesus, the Son, in this ministry and in other believers that were friends of theirs, were all saying, my vote is that she should live. She's done great things for Christ. She was the, a beautiful, beautiful person. She's done so much good in her life. My vote is that she should live. So that was the prophecy that came forth. If you had it in your heart that she would live, that's what was happening. Okay, so so why did did the why did the powers of the world of emanation not ratify that vote? I have the answer. For some reason I'm struggling. It came out it came out perfectly fluid for the Aldrich family this morning, but for some reason I'm struggling right now. But I will get it out because I have the answer. I have the answers. And I have the answers that have satisfied me and have, I believe, saved me. I believe this truth and understanding has saved me from any potential for being angry at God or, or having a wrong thought towards God. There was a time in my life when I was a disciple in Gospel Revivals that I met up with people that were angry at God. And I couldn't understand it. How foolish to be angry at God, the only one that could help you. See? And it's been real, pretty rough these last years. I've seen a lot of people die these past years. People in the ministry have died. Although they were not as involved with all of us as Sandra was. But we've had ministry, people in the ministry die. Aurelia really died. But I, I think you all knew Aurelia really better than you knew Hazel, who died. And then, of course, Margie died. We've had people die in the ministry. My parents died. My sister died. My brother-in-law died. My second sister died. I've experienced a lot of death. I don't know why I said that. Oh, hold on. So, oh, I know why I said that. So I'm in danger of being mad at God. I've actually experienced being mad at God. And I rebuke it, of course. It terrifies me to be mad at God, the one that keeps me alive from day to day. But that has arisen in my heart. And I crush it, but it's there. So this understanding that God gave me today is saving me from anger at God. I, I have a peace. So let me go on and try to. So, so I gave you the witnesses. Let me read you um, Salome's. Uh, oh, I lost my microphone. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I rebuke you in Jesus' name. This from Jesse. This came from Sulum. I was praying in the spirit today and saw this vision of Sandra's feet and hands having a tingling sensation. Then the next thing I seen was Sandra as a baby being rocked. I don't know what that means exactly, 
but thought I would share. She was swaddled up and someone was holding her, rocking her in a rocking chair. So I don't know if I made this clear or not. It's my understanding that everyone that has had relationships through Christ, Christ in them goes back to the Father who gave it. The Spirit goes back to the Father who gave it. But they're not, there's not an, they haven't had enough experiences to reincarnate. But what do they do? They're joined to the body of cells of righteous Adam. There is nothing that we do is wasted. It's just that there is a criteria. And, and this was part of my instruction today that was so enormous because for years I couldn't believe in angels. For years I prayed, what are, are these angels real? I couldn't believe it for years. And then it was a few years ago. It was the year that we went to Texas. Uh, uh, I got the witness from the Lord that angels were real, but it was very hard for me. But you know, Kabbalah teaches that there are, there, are, there are many angels that have no names and that there are many named angels. Kabbalah names them all. They're named in the book of Enoch. But now we're told Jesus is the only one. What does that mean? Jesus is the only angel. I preach that he's the only angel. Okay. Now they're all congealed under the name Jesus. Well, they're congealed under his name, but they still exist. There's only one change. Okay. The whole, the whole of the creation has taken on Jesus, the, the soul of the, Jesus of Nazareth, as a garment. That means every aspect of the life of God in the earth is now named Jesus. All of these angels still exist, but their name changed. Just like when you get married, your name changes. And now their name is Jesus. But they all exist. All the angels named in the book of Enoch, all the angels named in Kabbalah, they all exist. But their name is Jesus. And you don't have to study and know that this angel does this or that angel does that. You don't need that knowledge if you want something from God to know which angel to pray to because they all have the name of Jesus. So, there is a hierarchy of angels that I have resisted for years. I've resisted believing it for years. I just didn't, I, I did you know, for years I didn't believe it, and then for years it was, I don't know whether it's true or not. Well, this morning this was my instruction. God, the, the end stuff, we, we, we're taught from Kabbalah that we cannot even call the end stuff God because that would limit him to everything that's not God. And the end stuff is everything. So he doesn't have any attributes at all. The creation is taking place within him. The universe, as great as it is, is taking place within the end stuff. And the end stuff wants a relationship with his creation. Well, how does someone that has no attributes that how does he relate to his creation? How does he minister to his creation? How does he build his creation? Well, he does it. His will materializes as a host of angels in this lower dimension. It's him. It's the answer. It's the eternal one, okay? And, and I, I can't explain it any better than that. As, as the cre in the empty space, okay, in the empty space, he materializes as a host of angels. Well, I thought it was ancient Adam that entered into the empty space. Well, now I have a question. Are the hosts of angels ancient Adam? I don't know. That's another question. I preach to you because I'm preaching to myself, and I get another question. So now I understand the host of angels. Okay. They're the will of the Eternal One manifested in the empty space. And they exist, and they have functions, and they're literally building the creation. They're in control of death and life, and reincarnation and transmigration. There are angels in charge of everything. And it's a very ordered universe, a very ordered um, uh, army of angels. A very, and, and there is a, a tribunal that dis decides who lives and who dies. And that came out in the alternate translation yesterday. 
The second thing that I didn't tell you, I, I told you one of the clues that the Lord gave us was me telling you about what death means when, when we receive a spiritual communication from Christ Jesus, okay? In the world of creation, not the world of emanation where there's no misunderstanding, see? Okay? This, this nation will cease to exist, no misunderstanding, okay? Coming from the world of emanation. The world of creation, which is Christ in you, we need to learn his language. He's not learning our language, because he speaks to us in his language. He told me twice, oh, I didn't finish my thought. He told me twice someone was going to die. The second time, he actually didn't name the name of the woman that the Lord put out of the ministry. That, that woman that the Lord put out of the ministry, he will know her. Her, the, the reason she was put out of the ministry was because our Jezebel was so strong that she was challenging Christ Jesus in me. I don't even want to say challenging me. She was challenging Christ Jesus in me to the point that the Lord put her out of the ministry. Well, before that happened, there was a prophecy, not that she would die, but that someone else in the ministry would die, which shocked me, okay? There was another person in the ministry that had the same problem. But all that I knew was that I, I don't remember whether it was a dream or a word of knowledge, that that person would die. I was shocked, but I wrote it down. I was shocked when I was told my niece would die, but I wrote it down. But that name, that woman named, didn't die. Didn't, neither, one of them, neither one of them died physically. Okay? The woman named was not, did not die spiritually. Okay? So the, this is what happens in our dreams. I tell you all the time, you tell me there's a dream about somebody. I'm saying it's not that person. Because the prophecy is coming from Netzach Hod, which are the third and fourth out of ten sephir. They're low. But then we're still very low in the spiritual plane of things. For some reason, and I do understand the reason, we're still seeing with the mirror image. We're not seeing clearly. The prophecy that comes forth from Netzach Hod is the mirror image. So it comes up as someone else's name. Someone that had the same spiritual problem, who took the victory and did not die spiritually. The other one didn't take the victory and died spiritually. Whatever was, whatever is coming from Jesus Christ through me to you, that was in that woman that the Lord put out of the ministry, died. As far as God was concerned, she died. But he was never talking about her physical body. You see? So if I ever, ever get a word from the Lord like that again, I will say, Lord, are you talking about their body, their material body, or their soul? Because I'm learning God's language. Because I, I would have preferred to have been prepared for this. It's a terrible disappointment to all of us. I would have pre preferred to have been prepared for this. But it wasn't God's fault that I wasn't prepared for it. I didn't understand what he was saying to me. So, now, maybe you want to hear Hannah's dream also. Let me just, before I go on with the hierarchy, let me just show you Hannah's dream too. I had a dream about Mom last night. The parts of her were separating from her, being brought up going up into future generations. The small particles were slowly beginning to detach from her. They were like golden little lights. So I just woke up depressed thinking, I don't think she's making it. And then there were these two other witnesses from her sister and her daughter. At which point I spoke to Jesse and <clears throat> I said, it doesn't look good. And then, uh, I just went about my day, and it, it came to me that I, I, the Lord wanted to speak to the Aldridge family, and I called them on the phone, and the whole message that I'm, is coming out differently. Mm -hmm. I guess that's why it wasn't recorded. It's coming out differently for you. We get personalized ministry from the Lord Jesus Christ. So back to the hierarchy. There is a hierarchy of angels. There's a hierarchy of angels. And some of them did go bad. Some of them did descend on Mount Hermon, like we're told in the book of Enoch. It's, it's, it's all become more real to me. And there is a tribunal that decides who lives and who dies. 
And that was, that's in the alternate translation of Revelation chapter 14. I just preached it yesterday. And, and, and the other thing that came out in a meeting was, it, it shocked me. I don't know if any of you heard it or not. It shocked me so much that I couldn't even call Jesse and I think he heard it and he couldn't call me. It wasn't Sunday. It was either the previous Thursday or the previous Sunday. And what came out as I was preaching was, if you're not healed, it means you're not forgiven. If you're not healed, it means you're not forgiven. She's not forgiven? How, how could she be not forgiven? She, she was a beautiful, giving, lovely, committed person. How could she not be forgiven? That, that, that anointing that flowed out of her in the last conference, how could she not be forgiven? This is crazy. So, there was actually a tribunal. You know, you, you hear about this. I heard about all this in the old cult movies I used to watch. <laughs> In the, um, what's the name of the one with the witches again? Charmed. Charmed, yeah. I re read all about this stuff. I, I thought it was fantasy. Mm -hmm. But the children of darkness no more than the children of light. There is a tribunal that decides who lives and who dies. So on what basis do they make these decisions? On what basis do you decide whether someone lives or dies? What? What more could someone have done than Sandra? She preached the doctrine of Christ. She committed her life to God through this ministry and outside of this ministry. Committed to her children. Committed to her husband. Committed to her family. She raised her sisters when her mother was not able to. What do you want, God? What do you want? Do you see the potential for the anger? What, what do you want? So there's a criteria for determining who lives and who dies. And it's beyond our human uh, projection. We, we need to have our mind elevated to understand this. And the way I put it to the older children was like this. You are a family, and you have to be there for each other. You're both going to have your own lives. Maybe you'll get married, but if you don't get married, you'll have a life in Christ. But whatever, you will have substance in your life. You're going forward and you'll have substance in your life. But there's a root that you're coming out of. And you can never forget that root. You can never forget that you're a member of this family. I'm not going to cry during this message. I am not. No arguments. Any argument. You need to solve it immediately. Immediately. Well, that root exists beyond the family. God is raising a family, and his family is humanity. And there are all kinds of things going on that we don't know about. So we've all been very selfish, you see. We want Sandra. And her children, one Sandra, especially Andrew, who's only 14. And Jesse wants his wife. And I want Sandra for all that she's sown into me. She's changed me forever. Well, aren't we selfish, you see? Because this tribunal. They have all kinds of factors that we don't even know about. They're looking at future generations. And I don't know what the criteria is. I don't know what the facts are. I don't know what the criteria is. I have no idea. But their decision is righteous. I have to believe that. Now, it's also legal. There are also legalities. They had to be, we read about the court of the Lord, I think it's in Zechariah, Zechariah, Zechariah I think it's in Zechariah, where we see Joshua and, and the trial going on, and, and, and Christ is saying this is a brand pulled out of the fire. 
I always read those scriptures and said, well, he was saved by, by God's defense, by Christ. The defense always saved over the prosecutor. Didn't the, didn't, doesn't Christ always win over the prosecutor, the accuser, which is Satan? It never occurred to me that there could be someone like Sandra who would, who would be found uh, guilty enough to not have a body saved, because we're all guilty, brethren. And, and she's only 45 years old. So you get somebody that's 60 or 70, well, it's still too young to die, but 45 years old? What, what legal ground is there that, that all that she did in Christ didn't carry enough weight to save her body? So now the truth comes. That's hard to swallow. There were two sides to Sandra, like there were two sides to you and me. And her old man was not adequately dealt with. Did I make that decision? I didn't make that decision. She died. She died from a curse of premature death. I have been delivered from a, a, a curse of premature death. Why did I live and she died? Well, rather than I can't answer you unequivocally because I don't, I haven't seen the evidence and I don't expect to see it. I would be surprised if God shows it to me. Why? Because the evidence is cosmic. I think it's beyond the capacity of my Christ mind at this point. So there are cosmic reasons why her body didn't continue. But, but the reasons exist on every level. The reasons exist on every level. Brethren, all of you in this ministry, I don't know how seriously you've taken me, but you need to deal with your sin nature. And nobody Nobody, unless you're one of the very few people like me, that the Lord has chosen to show you all of your sins, okay? nobody sees everything in the unconscious part of their mind. So if he sends me to you with a word, you need to be very careful to go before God and find out what he's trying to say to you and not take me like, a fellow believer that is looking to pick a fight with you or to have some disagreement with you. Her sin nature, the, the degree to which she dealt with it did not rise to the level that, would have, that saved her body. Can you hear that? Do you dare to believe that? Does it give you a fear of God? I've been preaching it now for these last weeks. We need to be very afraid. Not that we walk around shivering like this, but we need to be afraid enough to really consider every word that comes out of our mouth, every response that we have, and every action that we take. We need to be very afraid to violate our brethren by thinking evil of them, or imputing wrong motives to them. We need to be very afraid with a reverential fear of God. Those of us that have the hope of going into longevity need to be triply afraid. Very careful. Walk very carefully. I'm not telling you that you're going to hell. I'm not telling you anything like that. I'm talking to mature believers that want, that are hoping to go into longevity. That are believing that if we don't go into longevity, that we'll have enough, uh, enough, uh, this is so offensive to the church, but we will have reaped enough in this world that our soul will go on in another form, our higher soul will go on in another form that will produce a life that will produce, that a soul life will emerge from us that will go on in another form. That we should have a testimony written in heaven 
that we've done well, that we've done the best that we, that we could have done. Maybe, maybe she couldn't. Brethren, we're fallen, we're fallen. Maybe she did the best that she could. And she just couldn't deal with her sins to the level that, that I have. I've been turned inside out a million times over. I have a high tolerance for pain. <laughs> yes, I do. I have a high tolerance for pain. Maybe she did the very best that she could. I keep seeing the tribunal as three angels. I don't know whether I'm, whether I'm being influenced or not, because I read recently that, and again, you can believe this or not, that Hillary Clinton was just tried by a military tribunal of three, um, I don't know if they were all generals or not, but three military personnel, excuse me, and found guilty. She's supposed to be executed on April 26th. I see it as three. So last night, when I still was hoping that she would live, the, the word in my heart then, and I believe it was true then, see, we need to understand this. When we get any kind of word of knowledge, that's what's true then. It's true then. But things change. Everything's continuously moving. Things change. So what I heard last night, and I think I typed it into the telegram, that the jury was still out. The decision wasn't made as of last night. I don't know what was going on there. I had a vision of Sandra's soul being conscious of all this as we read about it in the scripture. But the decision that came down that her body wouldn't live, it was, now this is really important, please let me get your attention. This was not a decision that said Sandra bad, she didn't make it. Not at all, not at all. The word that I had last night was that these angels had the ability to look into the future. And they have the ability to see if they, if they, you see, you see, she's un, under this curse of premature death. It's a legitimate curse of premature death. From as far as I know, heavy witchcraft, uh, in her, her grandmother at least, it's, it was open testimony of the degree of the witchcraft in her grandmother. And we know that her mother took her own life, so there are heavy, heavy curses on the family. Sandra was born with a hole in her head and uh, wasn't expected to live. She was taken to a woman of God who prayed for her and she was healed, but apparently the curse wasn't broken. She was just given an extension so that she could do all the great things that she did for Christ. And then it came time to, to, to implement that curse again from the angels that do it. You know? However, how was it decided? Now it's time to try and pull in, I say call in the marker. Again, I don't understand. I don't know. There are thousands and not millions of angels but the hierarchy of God. I, I can't comprehend it at the moment. I just started to believe it. I can't comprehend it at the moment. How it was decided, now it's time to try again. And it doesn't make the angels that come to take her life evil. You all grown up, brethren. Surely you understand. There are thousands, if not millions, of people that die every day. Thousands of I don't know the statistics. Thousands or millions of babies that are born, and thousands or millions that die. So there's a a, a department, an angelic department that takes care of who lives and who dies. They're very busy. Thousands of people dying every day. They're very busy. So how was it decided that, that, she, that she, she would die? Not only do they weigh the good that she did in Christ Jesus and the good that she could have done but she failed to do because of her sin nature, they look at what her potential is. Did she have the potential to overcome her sin nature? You see, what I'm trying to tell you is this. It was a legal ground to take her life. It was a curse of premature death. It was a legal ground 
to take her life. So this tribunal had the job of deciding whether or not to override the powers that have the authority to rule this world. Satan and Leviathan, they have the authority from God to rule this world. And the angels that are under Satan, which they're not necessarily evil, they're doing a job. We see that in, in the book of Job, Satan's just doing a job. And they looked at their records, it's like what you would see in charms, right? It's all real, it's all real. And they said, well, we now have legal ground to take this life, and we have to, we have a thousand people that have to die today, which are the thousand people going to be? How hard-hearted to those of us down here are still immature and narcissistic. They're not influenced like we're influenced. They're impartial. Well, there's legal ground. There's a curse of premature death. And look at what the family has done. Look, look at what she, look at the what she's inherited spiritually in, in DNA. Yeah. So, is is the good that she's done for Christ? Is it powerful enough? for us to intervene with the authorities that God appointed to run this world? Do we violate the law that God set in place? There's a law in this world. Satan and Leviathan rule this world. They're the, the, that old serpent, Satan and the devil. Satan and the devil rule this world. Legally, legitimately, are we going to intervene established authority. The tribunal has to be justified in doing such a thing. And I don't know what the criteria is. But that's what we're dealing with, brethren. So they look at a future. What happened with me? Why did I live in that time? Because they looked at the future. And they saw that I was a potential to bring forth this doctrine. And they checked out everything that they checked out. They looked at my bad qualities, which were very great. And they looked at my good qualities. And they said, we think she'll do it. We think she'll do it. We think she'll survive the persecution. We think she'll survive the pain. And we think she's faithful enough and hardworking enough to do it we have decided to override the powers of this world and let her live. It's the truth. Can you handle it? So they looked at Sandra's future. And I don't know what they saw. But they decided that it wasn't weighty enough for them to override the legal, legitimate authorities of this world that had a legal, legitimate right to take a life. Are you all okay? Do you still love the Lord? Do you still love me? Because some people can't blame the Lord, so they blame me. Maybe, maybe if she lived, Jesse couldn't be all that he's supposed to be. What do you mean, she? Well, every marriage is a struggle. I'm going to tell you something that's really going to be painful. I'm going to tell you. I didn't even ask Jesse's permission, but I'm going to tell you all. Because you are all in line to be priests of Judah, and you have to hear it when I'm going to tell you. There was trouble in their marriage. There was a struggle for the headship of that marriage. And there was a Jezebel spirit in our beautiful, beautiful sister Sandra that competed with her husband for the headship of the marriage. And as I, 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 everything I'm telling you, I've told them. I've told them and they've repented of it over and over and over again. It's no secret from them. And he could, he coulda, shoulda, woulda, but didn't overcome her. There was a Jezebel spirit in Sandra that was competing with her husband for the headship of the marriage. And she coulda, woulda, shoulda,
but didn't defeat it within herself. Are you still with me? It gets worse. When you finish listening to me, you're going to be really afraid of God. He's a righteous God. He's a holy God. And every judgment that comes down is righteous and legitimate. Sandra did not die a good death. She died a terrible death. She wasn't in physical pain, as far as I know. But she was tormented in her mind, in her soul, in her emotions. She had a form of leprosy. She watched her body deteriorate. She was a beautiful woman. She lost her hair. I, I, I have not been able to look at the picture. Jesse wanted to send me the picture. I said, please don't show it to me. I can't bear it. A couple of weeks ago. She was 175 pounds. That perfect figure of that beautiful woman was 175 pounds from the steroids. She gained all that weight. She lost her looks as a woman. She lost her ability to be loved as a woman by her husband. And then it got worse. She couldn't walk. She needed a walker. And then it got worse. She couldn't put herself on the toilet. Someone had to bathe her. Someone had to wipe her. Then they put diapers on her. You think this is normal. You go to any nurse or a medical professional and they'll say to you, well, I'm hardened to that. I see that every day. When my sister lay dying in the hospital in a coma to, I don't know what they were, AIDS, nurses, I don't know what they were, were chattering about their, what they were going to be doing Saturday night. I really asked them to leave the room. Well, they're in another timeline. They see it every day. Maybe that's commonplace to you. Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you know people that have gone through that. Well, that's just the way people die. No, that's not true. Oh, someone else died. Carrie died. She left the ministry of her own accord. She just, she just dropped dead from a standing position. Carrie dropped dead from a standing position. Then there was Peter Kimling, Hazel's husband, who he wasn't actually in the ministry, but we were close from Gospel Revivals. He just killed over sitting on a chair in the garage. They didn't go there. She lost her ability to talk. Not only could she not talk, she couldn't even type because the confusion was in her mind. She was utterly humiliated. That's the death that she died. Are you still with me? How come? Was it, it just happened? You think it was an accident? No, no. Everything's written down by the appropriate angel. You want to know the truth? The last time I saw them in a counseling session, I said something to the effect of, Sandra, you've got to try. Just try what? Curb your mouth. He has to stand up to you, and you have to try to sit down. And she rose up and said something, I don't remember what, the, which is the equivalent of, I can't or I won't or I can't. It, it, it was not a godly response. She walked out of that room, and the next day that I saw her, she told me something happened to her, but she didn't know what it was. I didn't know what she was talking about. She said, it's something in my mind. I believe that tumor came up like that. Like that. Where do you get that, Sheila? I get that from the Bible. I get that from the Bible. I read in the Bible that King Uzzah went into the temple and was, was burning incense, which is the job of the priest. And the priest came in and said, you have no right to do that. And he said, tough on you, I'm king. And leprosy came on his face right in front of them. I read that in the Bible. So you want to go into longevity, do you? 
You want to be a son of God? Do you? Are you ready to live the Bible? I just told you the truth. Shut your mouth. Children, shut your mouth. Parents, your children open a mouth to you. You want to discipline them with a godly discipline to save their lives. Shut your mouth. What? Her mouth was shut, wasn't it? She couldn't shut her mouth. Jesse couldn't shut her mouth. Justice, eternal justice, they would say, whatever that means, shut her mouth. She couldn't talk. Are you still with me? Jesse doesn't know I'm doing this, but God's doing it, so he's going to have to tolerate it. And probably say, okay, anyway, he's devastated. Right now, over his loss. And guess what? Jesse stood up and became the man in the family. Taking care of the kids, took care of his wife. I don't think anyone could have done more for her. Guess what? She actually needed her husband. And given the opportunity, he stood up and was all the man that he could be. Are you all hearing me? <laughs> I'm not, this is not a Sunday morning message in your local church, brethren. When my husband died a few years ago, and just in case there's a question in your mind, in the courts of this world, we were divorced. But when he died, the Lord told me to not say that I'm divorced because I never married again and he never married again. And the Lord said to not say that we were divorced. But for those of you that know, this is the explanation. When my husband died a few years ago, or just before he died, I actually had a prophecy. I have, a, I have the habit of typing out prophecies and tagging them to my wall. I had a prophecy on my wall that God was going to be kind to Bob. I was going to be kind to him. I had no idea what it meant. And when he died, he died in his sleep. And he had been ill. Uh, he had been ill, and then I think he was in a rehab. And my daughter and his grandchildren were there, and they visited him. God was kind to him. He was in his right mind. He wasn't in pain. He had family visiting him, and he died in his sleep. God was kind to him. God was not kind to Sandra in the way that she died. But he answered her own prayer. She couldn't, she, she shoulda, coulda, woulda, but didn't stop. He stopped her. I think if she had known what the future held, she would have stopped. She would have found the strength to stop. Put tape on your mouth. Put tape on your mouth. You have to be very careful what you pray for. You have to be very careful what you pray for. I also um, believe that I witnessed a brain tumor rising out of nowhere in my in Pastor Holt's house, his wife. They had every opportunity to recognize this message. Brethren, it's not me personally. It's the one inside of me. He, he knew who I was. I, I used to have dreams. It came up someone else in the congregation, but I used to have dreams that I was being drowned by somebody. And one day I was sitting in the congregation, and I was always in the front row. I actually saw a spirit of soul rise up in him and throw a javelin in my heart. He was so jealous of the anointing of me. And then he became ill. He had kidney problems, and his illness lasted a long time. He kept hoping he would get healed, but he didn't. And then he died, 
when almost immediately after his death, his wife was in a car accident, and it turned out that she had a brain tumor, and then she died within six months after he died. And I believe that brain tumor came up suddenly. One of the questions that I've had for years was with regard to Cobra and Cobra's rebellion. Did God really, did the ground really open up and kill them? Or did they just die spiritually? Did it mean they fell down into their karma? And surely, surely uh, a sinkhole didn't open up and they were all the Cobra and all that pertained to him, his whole family, and fell down and died. And surely it, they just died spiritually, you know, and then they just wandered away. But the, the scripture says, Muth, it's like necros in the Greek. They're dead. They're dead. See? They died. They died. They were part of a congregation that was in relationship with the very power of Jehovah. Brethren, we, we are not in relationship with the very power of Jehovah. We're not. We're in relationship with Christ, which is a soul part of righteous Adam. We're talking to the mediator. He's God to us, like a parent is a God, a God to a young child. He has all the powers, of, not all the powers, he has a lot of the power of God. He has all the power of God, but he's overseen. Like I told you, he was pronouncing Sandra alive, but the higher, the higher tribunal said no, as a punishment. No, 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 not as a, I don't believe it was as a punishment. I believe everything was taken into consideration that this was the problem that existed. Okay. As a group of doctors making a decision, I've been trying to tell you this for years, that when we reveal sin in people, it's the, it's the difference between what we do and gossip is this, is the, mo the motive is Christ, to help the person to find a solution, to hopefully bring them to repentance and change things. So, Maybe, I mean, I'm, I'm, ju I'm, ju I'm just guessing. Not, it was not a punishment. When all of the potentials of what would happen if she lived, if her body lived, and all of the potentials that would happen if her body died, they decided that in the, in the cosmic things of the scheme of things, it was better to leave her body die and her soul live and reincarnate. Now, we don't feel that way. And her husband and her children don't feel that way. But we're, we're spiritual children compared to, the, to what we're a part of. It has just opened up to me to I and to a greater degree. It's, it's, it becomes very heavy to live in this world. The more knowledge you have, it becomes very heavy. You, you carry an incredible burden. Once Christ Jesus is in us, every time we fall down into our carnal mind, we're doing great damage. It's just a maturing experience, brethren, that only comes through pain. Somehow, at least in my case, it just came through pain. So a decision was made when all the potentials were looked at of what would happen, not just to Sandra, not just to the Aldrich family, not just to them CCK, but to the human race and the whole scheme of things, of all future generations, that more good would come out of her body dying than her, being, her body being allowed to live. Can you believe that? Please believe it, because I believe it. I believe it. She was a wonderful person. But she had another side that she didn't take the victory on. And it was decided. This was decided. Maybe Jesse will be what he could have never been if they were married. You know, I ask the Lord the question all the time, or I wonder about it anyway. I left my husband when my daughter was six years old. I couldn't bear to live with him anymore. And I didn't really know Jesus at the time. I had met God in a, a Jewish synagogue. You might remember that. That was my testimony. And I remember standing in the middle of my living room 
saying, Lord, I, I can't bear it anymore. And I, I was sick. I, I've been sick since I was 11 years old. I, Brethren, I am doing fantastically now compared to, to what I was at the time that I had this testimony. I stood in my living room and I said, Lord, I just can't bear it anymore. But I'm afraid to leave him. I don't think I'll, I may not be able to take care of my child because I'll have to go back to work full time. And within two weeks, I just often left him. And with my naivety, I thought I'd get married again. Right? But then the Lord found me, and I wanted to get married again. But this, this is my life. This is what I was called to. He didn't have another husband for me. And the scripture says, if you cannot live with your husband, you can leave him. But you don't get married again. See? So I wonder, would I be what I am today if I didn't leave him? I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's probably no. Because it's the hardship that made me what I am today. I, I don't believe that he would have ever stopped me from, from serving God or from having a ministry. He never did anything like that. I don't think he would have ever, unless he would have changed, if the anointing would have caused him to manifest, and he would have changed. I don't think he would have ever stopped me from having meetings in the house or anything like that. But I would not have experienced the hardship that I've experienced after I left him. So my guess is I wouldn't be who I was today, but who I am today. But you never know. You, you never know. So now maybe Jesse is going to be something that he would have never been if he had a wife to lean on. So, is there anything else that you have to say to the brethren, Lord? Are there any questions? Do any of you have any questions? I've given you a very hard word, but I believe that you're all great. I believe that you're all very brave, and that we're a great ministry. I, I love all of you. I, I think the best of all of you. And I believe that you've heard my heart and that you've been relieved and you've been saved from any kind of anger or bitterness towards God. And I hope that this has sobered you because we're on the cusp, we're on the verge of entering into a whole new world. I'm still believing it's going to happen, but it's, you can't say it happened until it happens. I'm believing it's going to happen, but everything's changing continuously. See? The world is changing out there. I read in Benjamin Fulford this morning that General Miley has been overthrown. General Miley was the head of the, uh, of the Joint Chief of Staff of our military, and he was appointed by President Trump. Someone else who was not agreeing with, with the agenda of the Save America agenda was replaced by General Miley. And I guess General Miley hasn't done what needs to be done. There are factions in our military that are fighting with each other. So we'll see what happens now that General Miley has been replaced. And, I, and Benjamin Fulford says that uh, What's coming soon is the new United States of uh, North America, meaning the countries, the, meaning the continent is going to be reconfigured to include Canada and Mexico. Now, when there there are factions, in, in the people that have something to say about this, there are factions that want that, and factions that don't want that. We need to find out what it is that God wants. Uh, personally, it doesn't sit right with me, because the bigger something is, the harder it is to govern. But what do I know? So there are big changes coming in the country and in the world. There's a big war going on. It's a global war. And at the end of his article, his weekly article, he said there's a great utopia coming. So there were all these very intelligent 
educated people, politically active people that really believe that this Nisara Nisara is coming without Jesus Christ. It's not possible unless he will enter in and factor into it, but I don't see it because these people don't honor Jesus Christ. So there are big changes coming. And the, the more we understand the language of God, and the more we're willing to look at ourselves and not run away and hide from it, you know, the better chance we have of being promoted to being a part of what God's doing. He's doing it right now, we just can't see it, but it's happening, it's happening now. He's descending into us now, but he hasn't fully, did. he hasn't overthrown my soul yet. I would know it when he overthrows my wicked soul. I would know it because I have a wicked soul, Greg. Right? My soul is wicked. Some souls are more wicked than others. I have a wicked soul. So there's one other thing that I would like to share with you that doesn't have anything to do with this eulogy, but since it's on my heart, I'd like to share it with you. Maybe it does have something to do with the eulogy. Um, there was another dream, actually. I was in this dream. Let me take a look at that one. Uh, yes, she had this a couple of days ago when we were still hoping for Sandra's body to live. This was on the 17th. I had a bad dream, she says. I was holding a bunch of things in my hands, like a jacket and my sandals. I started running barefoot on the highway. 30 miles from my house and took a right turn to get back home. I was crying, trying to make it home because mom was getting worse. I couldn't drive my, this is the day, the day before she, she died. I, uh, well, she actually didn't die until today, but physically it was the day that she, physically she died yesterday, but she didn't really die until today. I was crying, trying to make it home because mom was getting worse. I couldn't drive my car because the road was blocked off for construction and there was a gravel space in between the road for that construction and I could see cars on the other side turning around and going back. I ended up getting to a family friend's house, the Kowitz and Jacob, that's her brother, was standing behind a counter and the son of the family who had redder hair, here's this red hair, who had redder hair than usual was deeply saddened about what was going on and told me if I ever needed anything to let him know. And he had tears coming from his eyes but tried to hide it. At one point, Dad was driving a UPS truck and I asked him if he was going home so I could drive with him and he said no. So I made my way back home. When I got there, people were working on the siding of the house and doing work on the resort. Dad was doing some work on the side of the house. Mom was inside like she is now. I looked to the lake and I could see Grandpa Don. And he was on a raft and came to the dock to come to me. He gave me a hug. He looked like he was living on the raft and was unclean. I didn't recognize him but knew he was my grandpa. I believe I ended up leaving or at least try to. I believe my grandpa was saying goodbye and wishing me luck. And my response to her was, it sounds like your mom is, that you're dreaming for your mom because no one knows what she's thinking. She can't talk. She couldn't talk for weeks, maybe months. I don't know how long it was going on. If she couldn't talk or write, she had no way of communicating except very basic sign language, like this if she had to go to the bathroom or this if she was thirsty or something like that. It sounds like your mom is having this experience. Apparently she's dying, but the Lord continues to tell me that she will live, so I believe it until the bitter end, at which point I will still believe it while your dad raises her from the dead, or until the Lord told me that she wasn't going to live. So again, we practiced what I learned from Reverend Bill Norton uh, that the people that can't even read or write but have faith in Jesus Christ practice. I believe that she was alive until God told me that he was taking her. I didn't, I didn't believe the doctors 
and I didn't believe the nurse, the hospice nurse that pronounced her dead, and I didn't believe the fact that she wasn't breathing. But then the Lord told the three of us that it was over, and I believe God. And I believe that she was, her soul, that she was alive, even though her body wasn't breathing for that, from the 18th until the 19th, when the Lord gave us this information. And the tribunal was being held. So what about this dream? I believe it was that Hannah was dreaming for her mother. And, uh, but the soul knew that it was leaving the body. But what I wanted to point out to you that I find very interesting to end this, this, Exhortation, eulogy, exhortation, whatever we want to call it, with some spiritual information because we're all very curious people here. So Grandpa Don was on a raft. I thought that was so interesting. When I was a young disciple, I used to have dreams of I didn't recognize the people, but they were they were sailing on a on a raft, and it was an open sea like the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean was a very large body of water. But the ship that they were on was like a little flimsy ship uh, with maybe, a, I don't know that I saw a sail in it, but some stick standing up from it. I mean, a little flimsy ship to be on a big ocean like that. And they looked like zombies. Their, their eyes were just empty, and they were just sailing on the sea. I never really knew what that meant until now. Okay. And the key that unlocked that information for me was this dream about Dawn being on a raft. Okay. So this dream that Hannah had recognized the spiritual condition of all of us, that we are spiritually adrift on a great sea. We're in the lower window of creation. It's called the lower window of creation. It sounds like a contradiction to say our, the unconscious part of our mind is the lower window of creation. But that's just our carnal mind, okay? Because the, the higher window of creation is underneath, it's closest to us. I don't even know if I have that right or not, but it just doesn't make sense to the carnal mind. We're in the lower window of creation and it is in the unconscious part of the mind, okay? But the higher window of creation is in the unconscious part of the mind too. So we have fallen down under the sea. And, and I've already told you that you all know that that we exist under the spiritual sea in the lower window of creation. But I saw us as living on the sea bottom. I never, when, when I've been preaching this, that we felt we were, that we're, this whole world is in the lower window of creation, I never saw us as sailing on an ocean. I sort of, I guess I really didn't, I didn't, my thought process didn't go that far as to whether or not we were sitting on the bottom of the sea. My thought process didn't take it that far. But now I'm putting that together, that this whole world exists in the lower window of creation, and that we're all, our souls are sailing on this, this sea. So we're, we're on top of the ocean, we're sailing on the sea. And the fact that Donnie appeared on a raft meant that the Christ in Hannah that was having this dream saw not only him, but all of us accurately, that we are adrift on a sea. And I connected that with what's happening politically in this world, what Tony taught us, and basically Tony was the first one that taught us, that uh, under that we were under admiral law. Supposedly President Trump has broken us out of that, but we were, so I won't acknowledge that we are. We were all under admiralty law. And that the Vatican actually owns our, they own our souls, they own our birth certificates. And the reason, the way that they could justify owning all of the human beings on the face of the earth is that they put us under admiralty law. What that means is that we, we're not living on land, but we're living on the sea. The admiralty law, British admiralty law, only rules over people that live on the sea. So I never asked the question, well, why would... Why would uh, the reason the Vatican owns us is because they were the one that they were the ones that lent the money. That, that I, I can't repeat the whole deal right now, but the the loan came from the Vatican, so they own our birth certificates. But the whole purpose of being under Admiralty law means they can do it because we were born at sea. 
Well, we're not born in sea, we're born on the land, but spiritually speaking, all of our souls are adrift on the sea in the lower window of creation. And that's how the, the spiritual powers that came up with this concept of owning all of humanity under admiralty law, they must have had some knowledge that our souls are all adrift on the sea. And that was how they came to that conclusion that they could, that, that they could own us because we're under admiralty law. We're all adrift on the sea. And that's what I got from that dream. So brethren, I have a peace in my heart. I pray for great mercy for Jesse and the children, and, and especially Hannah, because she was working hand in hand with Jesse. Must have been terrible watching Sandra deteriorate day by day. And the last days were really terrible when she lost control of her bodily functions. So I pray for great peace for you I think Hannah may be listening now. I hope that you're okay, Hannah, with the truth that I told you about your parents' personal life. They were good, good, good parents. I just told you the truth. Remember, you need to understand everything with your Christ mind okay, and learn from it. Your mother was a good wife. Your father was a good husband. It just, they weren't perfect. <laughs> they weren't perfect. And they, they came along in their imperfection. And as I preached it yesterday, they they fill their mind, they fill their mind with the with the word of God. And they fill their mind with this esoteric doctrine. And it mixed with their sinful souls and brought judgment on them. The average person that doesn't do what they've done, that didn't learn this doctrine, that didn't commit their lives to Christ. They can have an easy death. I, my next door neighbor died. He was on a, on a dolly under his car, fixing his car. He was a terrible man. He used to beat his wife. She would come out with a big black eye. You know? And he died without pain. You know? How does that happen? How does that happen? Well, there are all kinds of factors. Kabbalah says that if you suffer in this life, you don't suffer in the next life. So the suffering that your mother went through and the suffering that you, Hannah, and your dad went through and all of the family, but especially you and your dad being there minute by minute, day by day, is working to mature your soul and prepare you for the great future that God has for you. You have a great future ahead of you. And I pray that the truth hasn't made you bitter towards God, but that you understand it with your Christ mind. And go forward to be the very best person that you can be, to understand what God wants from you to the best of your, your ability, to pray for the ability to understand his language, and to understand what he requires of you, and to enable you to do what he requires of you, and to be all that you can be. So God is good, and he's perfect, and his mercy endures forever. And he loves you, and he loves us. I, didn't, I started this message telling you with what I heard on family radio, and I think I didn't repeat it accurately. The radio broadcaster said, whatever it may look like to you out there, everything, all, all is well, all is well. And God loves you, all is well. So you're upset now and you have pain, but to the best of your ability, you need to stand up and go on. Don't, don't wallow in your pain. Look to the future, because God is good. And all of you brethren, you all turned up for the spontaneous meeting. That says so much for your character. So thank you so much for showing up. I really appreciate you. Just for your information, when this video ends, which it looks like it's ending unless you have questions, or maybe, maybe if you would like to, if you have a microphone, is that telephone conference on? If you would like to, maybe you would like to just say something into this video. If you would like to do that, I'll give you some time to start calling in if you would like to do that. When this video is over, I will be asking Susan to, to run another video that should be no more than 10 or 15 minutes, which will be the eulogy for the funeral. Brethren, I cannot go to Minnesota. I, I'm really feeling very well these days. 
um, I think, God, I had a really rough time by the neck. Curse that came through the incident it really tried to take me out. I'm okay now, but I'm having a digestive problem. I, I cannot eat restaurant food. It's not even a digestive well, it is a digestive problem. It's not a digestive problem, and then I can't eat the food, but it raises my blood pressure, and my, and my uh, legs get all swollen. And I'm just on this really restricted diet uh, with my carrot juice every day, and I, I cannot eat restaurant food. I, the bottom line is I cannot eat restaurant food. The brethren took me out for my birth. I can do it once in a rare while. The brethren took me out for my birthday, and my legs are a little swollen. It takes about a week for it to go down from that one meal. I just really cannot eat restaurant food. And I, I have decided, Jesse invited me, but I have decided not to, to make the trip uh, to Minnesota um, based upon my health. I really, I really do feel well enough to go, but it's just too problematic. It's just too problematic. Uh, when am I going to put a burden on them that they have to have special food for me and then they have to cook it? And I, it, it, I, I decided not to go. I, I pray that everybody forgives me for not going. But I will be making a, an approximately 10 or 15 minute video for the eulogy that Jesse will probably pray, play at the, at the funeral. So, would anybody like to say goodbye to Sandra, say something good about her before we end the video? Anybody? Do you want to say something? I would. Um, I just want to say, say my condolences to the Aldrich family and um, I pray that the Lord gives them strength moving forward Amen. and that um, they look to the future and that the decision that was made was made based on their future. Amen. And um, I just, uh, I'd also like to just thank Sandra for doing the work that she did in this ministry. Yes. And the work that she did in the Lord, which will go down the line on and for her children and future generations and Amen. the sacrifices she made while she was here. Amen. And the work she put in. Um, Thank you for that. Amen. Would you like to say something to We don't have to if you don't want to. I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'll be. Um, there's uh, Tony's on the phone. Okay, Tony, would, would you like to say something? Who else is there? Tony and Brett. Tony and Brett. Okay, Tony, would you like to say yes, something? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Tony. Yes, I want to say, uh, I'm saddened, but your message was very comforting. Sandra was, to me, an inspiration. I remember that time we talked, we were laughing, and cared. I can tell that she really loved the Lord. I've been to the house, and they invited me, and all. Uh, saw the family together, and it was very loving spirit. And to me, you would, you, I could picture you calling her to do something. If she was able to do it, she would do it for you without even thinking, mm -hmm. as long as the Lord directs her to do so. So uh, she still lives on in all of us. She gives us all kind of memories. She would be missed, but in the spirit of the Lord, she always be. But like you say, when we look at the children, we see that she lived with them. So... It has been a pleasure knowing her and almost surreal, but your message different, but a deep understanding about how the decision is made, which bring me comfort. So thank you for sharing that. You're welcome, Tony. Brent, are you there? Yeah, hi, Sheila. Hi. Well, hi. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for speaking today. Uh, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's, it's very, very hard for me. Uh, just everything, you know, of longevity and, and you know, it's just, it's, uh, I just can't put it into words right now. But, uh, but for, for Sandra, you know, I've known Sandra for a long time, and she was an elder uh, for me. Uh, you know, even though she was 
you know, 10, 10, 11 years younger than me. She was my spiritual elder. And uh, uh, there, there's just times when she just actually just spoke to me and I could just feel the love and the compassion. And it, it just it just pierced my heart sometimes when she would speak to me and, and uh, teach me things. And uh, just that caringness that come out of her was just strong and I could resonate with it. And uh, so it, it, it's a huge loss. Uh, you know, for me and, and for the ministry, but uh, uh, and I, I'm just I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna miss her. Uh, so I just about all I can say. Do okay, Brent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, I. I I just want to give my condolences also, and uh, she she was she was a lovely woman and just a wonderful wonderful woman and um, and just very um, giving of her, of her like she did I never felt like she held back she mm -hmm. she was very giving of her affection and um, and uh, uh, kindness and her time and and she was. She was a help to me in um, in different conferences and different um, things with the the ministry. She was always there to to help me out and organize things, which was just just a gift and um, just just really wonderful. Um, and I I I I really I really miss her. I really miss her. She's just a I, and I I I see everything that you're saying and. It's just very difficult. It's very difficult. So I just, um, I just pray for God's mercy on, on all of us that me and, and the and the family. And I'm really truly sorry. Amen. Okay, God bless you all. And if any people or anyone's watching this video that you're not a member of this ministry, God bless you. And I pray for the very best for you. I am. Um, <sighs> I give my own personal condolences to the Aldridge family. I've already done it privately. She was a wonderful woman. She was my friend. And um, even though I was her pastor, she mentored me in many areas and strengthened me. And I will greatly miss her. I will expound on this in the 15-minute eulogy that will go to the um, go to the few. Okay, I'm going to end this now. God bless you. God is good. Amen. And, uh, and Jesse just it said thank you for everybody who's spoken, and God bless you, brethren. Thank you so much for your continued prayers. I love you, Pastor.